Danny, before we come to your so I didn't want to be to your work, because Margaret, one, one more question: uh, Was it easy to have these two works, or was it was it immediately that you would share these two works with the audience? Or no, I could have gone a, um, a several different directions. I mean, um, I think like Danny suggested, this is not an easy work. It's yeah. uh, I think it, you know. If you're really looking at Gober as an artist and not just thinking about him as a commodity, a current mm -hmm. commodity, um, his work is uh, an acquired taste. It's not easy to live with this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, you can't help but wonder where the rest of that little girl went or uh, what he's trying to say about his relationship with women or, I, d I don't know. Um, so it, it, it's never comfortable. Um, you know, the manuscripts are quite different. They're very private and yeah. they're kept in boxes and you have to make a, you have to be willful about wanting to look at them. So there are other things, um, paintings that you all would recognize that I could have brought up, but I thought this showed the most yeah. um, dramatic stretch. One more last question for this. Where does it normally hang? Is it in your house, in your living room, or where is it? Um, I have um, a building uh, behind, I have a very, what I call a beaver cleaver house, like a yeah. normal little house. Um, my husband and I raised three girls there. We wanted them to have as normal a house as possible. And it didn't have large walls. And um, so we bought a work of art um, by Franz Klein at one moment. And we walked out of the gallery and um, he said, you know, we don't have a wall that will, um, contain that picture and I said I know I was hoping you didn't know um, so <laughs> we had to yeah. um, decide right away whether we wanted to move house or whether we would build something else and we built a little space in the back that we call B2, B2. Um, and um, this Gober piece it's when it's not out on loan is usually in B2 and with <laughs> four or five other Gobers that kind of make a wonderful uh, there's a there's a conversation that's happening down there that's very private, and um, I wish I knew what it was. But okay. Danny, we come to your. Well, I actually want to talk oh, about sorry. your Gova piece because. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I am. Um, I mean, I've never heard of this artist or never seen the image before, but it's a sort of post Duchampian idea of. Yeah. Uh, well, Duchamp's. Duchamp is the great anti-art artist, so whatever he tried to do and to ridicule the art world turned on its head and it became the, the, the art of the day to, to talk about. And ever since that, conceptual art's taken off. Uh, I'm not looking for new ideas particularly, um, even though I don't know if artists in the ancient Greek days were trying to do new ideas, who knows, but they were doing their craft. But I do find this work rather intriguing I don't like it aesthetically, it's ugly, but I think it's fascinatingly interesting. And you could talk about it for hours if you felt that way inclined. I'm glad I chose something that you yeah. think is interesting. I like your Salvador Mundi coming up. I, I might not sleep tonight, actually. <laughs> <laughs> me either. Uh, it's given me nightmares. I, think. <laughs> I did know a girl who, oh, sorry. I, I, <laughs> Next one. Oh, your choice. Um, your choice, please. Well, th this is um, a picture of What's Christ. What's the real size? Because now it's, it looks no, like... No, it's, it's about yeah. that big. Um, it's by Quint an artist called Quentin Matzeis, who came from Antwerp in the late 15th century. And in the early 16th century, had managed... I think he was influenced by Italian art, particularly Leonardo da Vinci, and changed his style dramatically from this Gothic type of Gothic Renaissance painting uh, or late Gothic painting, like following from Van Eyck and, and um, Petrus Christus into this more relaxed painterly style, which he painted in the early 16th century. This picture, however, takes uh, Ikean tradition of um, the Byzantine tradition of iconic, an iconic form of Christ looking straight at you uh, to be worshipped and um, almost like an icon. But it, it has the different method to how you worship an icon. You're not to worship that. That's supposed to radiate an inner light from itself and you're in, in there with, the, with, with Christ and, and you find your meditation and piety through this image. But 
what the artist has managed to do here is, is create this amazing image with the finest little hairs possible to paint, taking hours and hours in daylight, because you can't paint at night. It must have taken a year probably to paint that picture. And you can even see in the jewel radiating another image inside the jewel, every line of hair. And if you notice, his right side is white, where the left side is dark. So he would have taken the sun, if he would have had more suntan on the right from preaching in the wilderness. Um, the, this hand here, you'll notice his fingernails are dirty, noting the common man. But there's, ra there's light radiated on his fingers, which is coming from the frame. So it would have had an integral frame originally, and light would have come off it. This is, um, I, I got this by chance. Um, there was a church in Bath in England that acquired this work. It was given by King George IV in 1820 and about two years ago the church needed to raise some money one of the auction houses contacted me as they wanted to keep the picture in England and uh, wanted a, a, a collector. I mean, it's very rare that I'm actually treated as a collector because I am a dealer and therefore as far as um, Dante goes I'm pretty far down that pit. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to get further down, but I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty far down. And uh, I am actually a collector. I do collect uh, things, objects, works of art of all, of all periods. And uh, the opportunity to acquire a work like that comes on, I think, once in your lifetime. You'll, I'll never see anything like that again. And um, I had to uh, rob a bank and um, they haven't caught me yet and uh, acquire this work. It's interesting also that the color of his dress his cloak is this purple color which goes back to porphyry which is the imperial color in Rome and was imperial color in in um, in Romanic Egyptian times the Ptolemaic period it's Egyptian porphyry so porphyry purple is used in the clerics in the Catholic Church very much today as the principal color for vestments and ecclesiastical ve uh, gowns uh, what else can I say about the? He, he, of course, has a halo, and the light on the left-hand side is reflected from the light coming in on the left-hand side of the picture. And you see the shadow there, on the, there, that sort of curve. That's the back of his head reflected again to the light. If you look into his eyes, I don't think you can blow this up, you can stare right into the pupils of the eye. It goes on forever. It's, it's a quite a scary picture, this, actually. I don't know how you relate to this. Danny, how come you, you really describe it as a work of art with, with, with the maximum, the ultimate possibilities of what, what painting can do on a small size painting like this, but you're not saying anything about, about who is this guy? It's um, we all know who it is, but it, this is a very powerful image of Christ. And, and, I mean, it's in your living room. I saw it yesterday night. Yeah. And so... It is a very. Yeah. It's almost. Well, it's what does that? The, the religious content of this painting. No, I'm. I'm not religious. I'm an atheist. I'm. I'm a practicing atheist. Um, and this would keep me up at night. Yeah. That could, um, <laughs> if if you're Catholic, it might disturb you. If yeah. you're Protestant, you wouldn't have a problem. If you're a Buddhist or anything else, you wouldn't have a problem. Or Jewish, you wouldn't have a problem with. Well, Jews might, but I'm Jewish myself, but I don't have a problem with you it. You regard it as a painting. I just look at it as a great work of art. Yeah. It has incredible strength. It has incredible emotion. It's hauntingly beautiful. The, the image of Christ as a beautiful young man, you have to look into art history to find when this comes out. Probably comes out in about the sixth century. You start getting these kind, which I think goes back to the Alexandrian idea of the great hero, Alexander the Great, who was, became a god. Almost got it, got so, it we like. go, so we go on to the next painting. Because yeah. Otherwise, we yeah. Well, I can do it. There's oh, another. This one. Yeah. Um, is that? Well, this is the first picture I ever bought. Uh, it's okay. in 1980 in New York. It was. It's by an artist called Bartolomé Spranger, and he um, trained. He was Flemish-born, trained in Italy, met, um, was influenced by Correggio and Parmigianino and became court sculptor, court painter in Prague under Rudolf II, who had this incredible court for um, 
uh, what, what's the word where you transmutate uh, gold into metal? What was it called? Alchemy. alchemy. He, he had alchemists, scientists, philosophers, poets. It was a very rich court. And he was the court painter, and he created this mannerist style of painting. Normally, the, the paintings are very sensual, um, sort of people making love and chasing through the woods, and all this mythological series. And here you have a series of the um, mystic marriage of St. Catherine, where she mystically has a, a, a marriage with Christ, and um, her she's martyred on the wheel, the, the, the Catherine wheel, which in fact didn't kill her. They, they cut her head off in the end. And um, they're using these incredible shot... Actually, that's not the right colour, but they're shot colours. It's incredibly beautifully painted, this picture, and it's very sculptural. I like pictures to have a sculptural quality. I like the three... I personally prefer sculpture to painting. I always have done because of being brought up in the classical tradition of Greek and Roman sculpture. But this is called mannerist sculpture, where everything is contraposed. Everything has a question and an answer. It's the left leg turns, therefore the head will turn the other way to compensate, to form the composition. It's moving, it's, it's almost dancing. Yeah. Does that, does that speak to you now? Uh, well, dance, yes. Uh, this, is, let's um, go to oh, this is another one. This is, uh, well, when I was a kid, I was brought up in Margate on the Kent coast, where we, we have a house there now. And... Uh, I remember the, the, this incredible light that was in, in, all over the Kent coast. And Turner, if you read about Turner, he was attracted to the light in the East Kent coast, saying that it was the greatest light in, in Europe he'd ever seen. And um, in fact, what happened then was that the smog and all the stuff from burning coal in, in London went down the Thames estuary, all the way out into the Thames, all the way out to the North Sea. And when the light, the sun came out, it burnt through and created these fantastic colours. And that's what Turner actually saw. It's not just truly a romantic tradition of painting uh, nature as he sees it, as against the 18th century tradition in England of controlling nature. There were these images that he actually saw, and which you still can see on the Kent Coast today. This is Margate, where by Turner, it's a late work of the mid-1840s, uh, there are very few of these pictures in private hands. I think it's less than seven at the moment, or eight, something like that. And um, this is uh, a, mu a small work. It's about that big. And it shows wreckers, these boats on the left-hand side, which is a horrible thing to do. They take these boats out and they lure innocent um, shipping vessels onto the coast and they fall upon the rocks and then bandits come out and steal all the works of art. They're using a capstan there to take in the flotsam and jetsam of the, what's been left over from the sea. But it has an ethereal light. The, the sun is being burnt through at the moment. and it's, I mean, this is before Monet came along. This is Impressionist, I think, pure Impressionism before its time. Um, I uh, absolutely adore this I painting. Like, I'd like to hear you talking about paintings, though yeah. most of us do know you as a, as a dealer primarily oh. in, in sculpture, but, but this is your last example to show. Oh, this, this one is, is um, well, I, I um, saw Frank Auerbach's work in the 80s in the Royal Academy and thought it was absolutely ghastly, hated it, and walked out and never bothered to look at it. And then um, about 10 years ago, I think it was 2004, I walked into Marlborough Fine Art looking around and I saw this picture and it completely knocked me for six. And I thought, oh, I got that guy wrong. I was completely wrong. And this is a picture, very large, it's over six foot long, of Mornington Crescent, done in 1966, where the statue here is of Cobden, the social reformer, who was um, um, Walter Richard Sickett's f father-in-law. So you get from Degas to Sickett to Bomberg, who taught Auerbach in the Borough School in London to Auerbach. The paint on this picture is literally that thick. It, you can actually scrape it. And it's painted about seven times. He paints it, scrapes it off, paints it again. Now I'm a complete Auerbach fanatic. I think he's a great painter.